Amen. All right. Would you please take your Bibles with me uh, this evening and turn to Proverbs chapter number four. Uh, Proverbs chapter number four, and we'll be uh, continuing in our studies. We're going to uh, read verse 20 down to the end of the chapter. So Proverbs chapter number four, uh, we uh, will look at a subject this evening that we've already looked at in the book of Proverbs. And actually, as we study the subject, we find that this is a prominent subject throughout um, not only the book of Proverbs, but really throughout the Bible. And uh, we're going to find the importance of the subject this evening. And so notice Proverbs chapter 4, and uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 20. Go down to verse number 27. So Proverbs 4, verse 20. The Word of God says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Now let me pause and say this right now. I know both of my sons are listening. So, I'm telling you right now, David and Leland, you better be listening and sitting down. Amen? I'll ask some questions when I get home. And uh, so, uh, notice here verse 21. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Notice verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left, remove thy foot. From evil. I would like to draw your attention to verse number 23. And by the way, this verse is often quoted, but notice again with me, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I want to preach this evening on this. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Now once again, we find an emphasis this evening on the heart of man in our text. Uh, we have understood the importance of the heart in several of our previous studies. Actually, I believe it's three of them. We've already addressed this important subject. There is a, a response contrast in the following verses. In the beginning of this section, the son is encouraged to incline his ear, but in the last four verses, the son is warned about his mouth, his eyes, and his feet. Uh, while we see this contrast and response, we must not forget what stands at the center of this issue, it is namely the heart. You see, the key verse in our text is verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it, the it refers to the heart, are the issues of life. Now notice verse 21, as he says here that we are to keep, and he's referring here to the words uh, and to his sayings, keep them in the midst of thine heart. So, what uh, he is teaching is to be kept in the midst of the heart. And then in verse 23 he says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. So we're looking at the heart this evening, and we have repeatedly, uh, in our study of this book, emphasized the heart in the previous studies. Let's go back, just for sake of review here. In Proverbs chapter 2, notice verse number 2. So that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Uh, later in verse number 10, notice, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Again in chapter 3, verse 1, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Verse 3 of chapter 3, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. Again in verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. And so, we've already seen an emphasis on the heart, but in the very chapter that we've been studying, in chapter 4 and verse 4, he also said, He taught me also, and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Now, as we come to our text this evening, there is clear, the key verse is, To keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So we've looked at how the heart is to uh, bring wisdom inside. It is to be in the midst of the heart. This wisdom, this instruction that's been given, and it ought to be regarded in the heart. It is not just a head knowledge. 
It ought to be something that is down in the heart. And so here again, we look at the heart, but I want us to consider uh, two points this evening. First of all, in verse number 20 down to verse 22, we consider the influence on the heart. The influence on the heart. Notice verse 20 says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings, let them, that's the words and the sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. We notice here the influence of on the heart. Consider first of all, in verse number 20, the disposition to wisdom. Here again, this, is, this verse is repeated throughout the book of Proverbs over and over again. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. And it is said in different ways, but this is repeated throughout the book of Proverbs. And so here we see the emphasis of this verse being repeated is on the disposition of the son towards a father's instructions, towards a father's um, words. Notice the word, he says, attend to my words. We look, we've already looked at this word. The word attend means to prick up, uh, to hearken, to give heed. It is someone that is uh, enthused about learning something. Now, it's interesting because in children, you can tell when they're interested in learning and when they're not interested in learning. I remember my uh, my, uh, my uh, son's uh, uh, grandparents there, uh, my in-laws, uh, wanted to uh, buy him a, a pellet gun. And so uh, I told my son, well, we're going to go in the backyard and I'll teach you how to, how to handle it properly and uh, try to teach him some principles about uh, how to handle something of that nature. And he was all ears. He listened to every single word I, that, that, I, that, that I told him because he was excited. He wanted to know all about it. Now, when it comes on how you sweep underneath the table, he's not so excited about that type of instruction. You see, the intensity is different, but here it means to prick up. And when it comes to the wisdom from the Lord, uh, we are instructed here that we ought to give full attention to the words. Uh, then the word incline, incline thine ear unto my saying. The word incline means to stretch to bend to or to bow to. So here we find the disposition to wisdom. And by the way, let's not just think that this just applies to children. This, by application, applies to all of us who are under the Word of God and who desire and thirst for the Word of God. We ought to attend unto God's words and we ought to incline ourselves. That means our disposition must be one of humility, of submissiveness to the Word of God, uh, of eagerness to listen to what God has to say. Uh, by the way, I'm thrilled that, uh, I'm not thrilled that we're, this is the, 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 the setting, but I'm thrilled that we can have online, uh, project the service online so that people can listen to what the Word of God. And I hope that people that tuned in tonight uh, tuned in because they want to hear from the Word of God. And so we find here that this is an eagerness to hear from God. Now, we have seen the disposition of a son is to always remain the same. It is a disposition of humility and submission. The words used in the verse convey an eagerness and an earnestness on the part of the hearer to attend to the words and to incline himself to his saying. Now, I would like to make a point that I have made light reference to in our previous studies. There is an assumption in the book of Proverbs throughout the entire book that those who are in a position of authority are teaching and instructing their children in the ways of the Lord. That assumption is built in. You see, it is clear that if a parent does not incline himself or herself to God's word, uh, that he is most likely not going to be able to teach his children. So there's an assumption here uh, that the father and the mother are doing that very thing. You see, uh, as I mentioned here, it is clear that if a parent does not incline himself or herself to God's word, it, it will be very difficult for them to influence their children in a direction they themselves have been unwilling to take. A passion and a desire for God's word and biblical wisdom is better learned by being observed than it is by being taught. When a child sees what to do, he has a greater chance of duplicating what he saw than he would in duplicating what he heard. 
Now you say, well, I want my children to submit to God. I, I want them to know the Lord. I want them to serve the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, then I, uh, that, that's a commendable thing to say. But I would say to us, are we submitted to God? Or are we demonstrating to our children that we have a passion for God, that we are submitted to God, that we have a desire to know the Lord, and we, we ourselves are serving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because if we want our children to serve the Lord in that way, we certainly must demonstrate how to do so. Simply a verbal teaching to tell them something to do that you yourself are not doing is not going to accomplish anything. You see, it is of no value for us to require our children to do something that we have not required of ourselves. So we find here the disposition of wisdom. So whether it is the teacher or the one who's receiving the teaching, the disposition is always the same, and that is a disposition of humility and of submission to the Word of God. And by the way, I believe now more than ever that churches, there ought to be people gathering around uh, when this whole thing opens back up and coming back to church and a, a group of people who says, we want to know what God says and we want to do what God says. We don't want to listen to what the world says. We are willing to submit ourselves to the word of God. So we find the disposition to wisdom, but secondly, in verse 21, we find the discipline for wisdom. Notice what he says to his son. Let them, now he's referring to uh, the words and to the sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. Now the word them, used twice in verse number 21, refers back to my words and my sayings in verse number 20. To not allow these words to depart and to keep the, these words in the heart is impossible without discipline. Uh, what we talked about, uh, those who would like to refer to themselves as the disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, the word disciple carries with it the idea of discipline. So we cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ without any discipline. And certainly it is true that we, uh, when we read those words that we're not to let them depart and we are to keep them in the midst of our heart, that that involves discipline. This is hard work and any work that is worth our while will be a difficult work to do. Particularly when we understand how prone our hearts are to wander away from God's words. Now I know it is the case for me. Now let us combine these two verses together, verse 20 and 21. Notice, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. That's our disposition. Let them, the words and the sayings, not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Now, Solomon is writing uh, here, uh, this book, and we know under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, it is not his wisdom, it is the wisdom from God. But Solomon here is trying to capture the attention of his son as well as the heart of his son. Both the ear and the heart are absolutely vital to the spiritual success of a son or a daughter. Notice here, verse, one, verse 20, he emphasized incline your ear, but then in verse 21 he says, keep them in the midst of thine heart. So there's the ear, uh, he, a child must be instructed, but also think about there is the heart element that a child is uh, basically uh, instructed to keep these things in his heart. You see, the wise man certainly will do all that he can to instruct and command the ear of a son or a daughter. In their youth, children are very dependent upon a wise father and a mother for godly instruction and wisdom. In the early years, they have no choice but to give their ear to those in authority. I'm talking about children, right? They have no choice. There's consequences for that if they don't give their ear. And it is all important that we learn how to listen. That's clear. But there must also be an emphasis on the heart. Now that's equally important, if not more important. You see, the heart, unlike the ear, cannot be commanded. It must therefore be one. You can tell a child and my children right now, I dictate to them what they must do. There's coming a day when I'm not going to be able to dictate what they must do, and I hope certainly that God has their heart. The prodigal son is a perfect illustration of that. 
He's a good example in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 24. This example is fitting as it applies to that this son was given boundaries during his early years. And he was certainly required to submit to his father. He was obligated, certainly as a Jew, to attend the services of the local synagogue. He was required to abide by a moral standard. He lived under the control of his godly father. However, his heart was interested in the far country and all of the indulgences that he was uh, deprived, uh, they were consuming his thoughts. He thought about all the things he could do with his inheritance and he and, uh, thought very little, if not, about the consequences of his actions. Even though his conduct and submission could be monitored, his heart could not. And that's the simple truth. It is imperative that parents today hold a standard of holiness in their homes. But it is impossible for parents to produce such a standard in the heart. John Phillips wrote this. He says, parents can and must command obedience in their homes. But they cannot legislate holiness. You see, we all, we have all heard the expression, you can bring a horse to the water but you cannot make him drink. And so therefore, when it comes here to the ear and the heart, understand that both of those are absolutely necessary when it comes to training a child. So there's the disposition to wisdom, the discipline for wisdom, not only uh, a hearing, but also a keeping in the heart. But uh, thirdly, there is the delight of wisdom. Now, we're going to hit again on the heart because of verse 23. But let's deal, first of all, before we go there, to the delight of wisdom. Now, again, throughout the book of Proverbs, he does this. He explains, and here he does so in verse 22, for they, now the they is referring back to the words and to the sayings. They are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. So we know that we must constantly be reminded of the benefit and the value of God's instruction and wisdom. The heart must never be left to itself, but must always be provided with clear direction and purpose. It is always beneficial to remind ourselves and our children of the great value of wisdom. A constantly repeated theme of Proverbs is that both Quality of life and length of life are enhanced by paying heed to the book's wisdom. We noted in our last study the great benefit of the path of the just, right? Uh, just in verse number 18, the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. And you see, not only when we teach our children should we teach them what is right, but we should express to them the great benefit there is in living in such a way. You see, such wisdom should be our delight. So we find the influence on the heart. We see the disposition to wisdom, the discipline for wisdom, and the delight of wisdom. But I want us to see, number two, the importance of the heart. Notice verse 23. He says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You see, it is only in the heart that wisdom has any life and power. Uh, what I mean by that is, if you hear wisdom and instruction, and it comes in your head but not your heart, it has no life and power. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't change anybody's life. But it is when it penetrates the heart that it makes the difference. We are not dealing with an outward conformity, but rather with inward transformation of the heart. You know, Jeremiah 17, 9, we quote this verse all the time, but we know the heart and what the heart is. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We know that's the heart. Now we understand that. That what God desires above all is our hearts. God has never desired, let me say that and be very clear about this. God has never desired for an outward conformity to the absence of the affection of the heart. He has never desired for that. He has never desired for puppets just to conform outwardly, but their hearts be far removed from Him. That has never been God's desire. Such was the warning of God's people in the Old Testament. Such was the warning to God's people in the New Testament. And such is the warning to God's people today. For example, in Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, 
uh, before the children were about to go into the promised land, God made it clear to them, and he said this, Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the thing which thine eyes have seen, and lest thou depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. You see, God and the children of Israel, He was not interested in some outward conformity. He wanted their hearts. And He says, don't let your heart depart. Keep your soul. Now, in Proverbs, we have keep thy heart with all diligence. Here in Deuteronomy 4.9, He says, keep thy soul with all diligence. He said the same thing in Deuteronomy 8, verse 1 and 2. Jesus Christ Himself condemned the religious generation of His day, repeatedly condemning their hearts. In Matthew 15, 8, Jesus said, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He said in Mark 7, 6, He entered and said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of, your, uh, of, your hypoc- of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The New Testament believers are repeatedly instructed to consider the underlying motivation of their actions. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6, the Bible says, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That's what God is interested in. He is interested in the heart. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, he's particularly talking about uh, the gifts that we bring, uh, such as the tithes and the offering. He says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And so he talks about in our giving. Do we understand that God is not interested in our money as much as he is in our hearts? He'd rather have somebody who has no money but have their heart than someone who can pay all the church bills but yet not not have his heart. God is interested in the heart because guess what? When God has the heart, he doesn't just have 10%, he has 100%. So God is interested in the heart. I think that there's a fitting example of two particular believers in the early church of Acts in Acts chapter 5 by the name of, and we know them, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, They were forcefully confronted with the corruption, but understand the corruption of their heart. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, when Peter confronts Ananias, he says, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? He said then in verse 4, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And so understand, the problem with Ananias and Sapphira is not that they kept back part of the part for themselves. They were pretending that they were giving 100% as all the people were in the church, and that's what their accusation was for. But understand, God was interested in their heart. He didn't want their money. He wanted their heart. But in their heart, they devised Wickedness, And so the importance of the heart is clearly emphasized all throughout the scripture and it must be emphasized today that God's people must not be a group of people who come to church, leave church, come to church, leave church and kind of perform the religious duties out of ritual and out of habit. That's why we emphasize on Sunday that Easter is not about us observing a day. The typical American in our country goes to church twice a year for uh, Christmas Eve and for Resurrection Sunday as if it's a ritual, as if it's a task that they have to do to fulfill their religious duties. That is not Christianity. God is not interested in that. He's interested in the heart. You know what that means? That when He has our heart, He has us 24-7. And so there's two things that we find in this verse 23. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. First of all, he deals with the protection of the heart. The protection of the heart is clear. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence. Now, there's the word keep, which means to protect and to guard. Keep thy heart, but then he adds, as if that's not strong enough to guard with all your your, your might. Uh, But he says, with all diligence. So there's a double emphasis there to keep your heart with all diligence. Now we know the importance of the heart, as I said, it is emphasized throughout the scripture. In Psalm 24 verse 3, the Bible says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? 
Or who shall stand in the holy place? He that hath clean hands, and what? A pure heart. Who hath not lifted his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. You remember the prayer uh, when uh, David, after his sin with Bathsheba, and his son died, his prayer of confession after being confronted by Nathan the prophet. In Psalm 51, verse 10, uh, 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 David prayed, Create in me a clean heart. A clean heart. So this, is the, this idea of protecting the heart, uh, making sure the heart is clean and pure is very important. You see, wisdom mu must find its interest in our uh, entrance into our hearts. We must not be content with a knowledge of God's law, but with an acceptance in the heart. Remember that we are never to stop at knowledge. Certainly, knowledge is a great start, but wisdom is using that knowledge which we receive in the right way. We once again mentioned the example of Daniel. Uh, Daniel was not the, I mean, not Daniel. Um, yes, Daniel. <laughs> he was not the only Israelite that was, that was taken captive. There was no doubt other Israelites that had knowledge of God's law. Nevertheless, they did not keep God's commandment in the matter of the king's meat. Therefore, we ask ourselves the following question. What made Daniel different than all of the other Israelites who were taken captive? Well, the Bible tells us in Daniel 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Get that. He purposed in his heart. He made a decision. What separated Daniel from all of the other Israelites was that the laws of God were in his heart. It was not just something he heard that he thought he had to live by. It is something that came into his heart so that he knew that under any circumstances he would not violate the law of God. The word purposed here simply means that Daniel went beyond his knowledge of right and wrong and he made a decision. He determined that he would follow through and use the knowledge he had for the glory of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 119 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, that is the difference between the head and the heart. You hear something, it's in your head. But if there's no commitment on our part to say that is what I want to live by, then it's not in the heart. Understand, if knowledge comes in the head, it makes absolutely no difference in our lives. It must penetrate the heart. You see, the psalmist here in Psalm 119 verse 11 is motivated to not sin against God. That's his motivation. He understands that a mere knowledge of God's law is insufficient, and so he therefore purposes to hide God's word in his heart. And so when temptation comes, the heart has already settled the matter. It's already been determined. His desire to please God has brought the law to life. Wisdom is alive in his life now. It's not just something that he heard. He says, well, and now there's a debate. No, it's already been settled in the heart. Let's go to Psalm 119 because we know the, this great uh, psalm is uh, an emphasis on the Word of God. And clearly we find here in Psalm uh, 119 uh, how important the Word of God is in each one of our lives. But I want you to see how often the heart is repeated in this psalm. Psalm 119, notice in verse 2, the Bible says, Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with the whole heart. I like that. The whole heart. Not just part of it. The whole heart. But I want you to see here the language. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Okay, so we have a record of his testimonies. But here then he says, and seek him. Who's the him? You see, now he's not talking about the word of God. He's talking about God himself. So we ought to keep his testimonies, but also seek him with our whole heart. You see, that is, uh, that is where uh, we, uh, that is the disposition. You see that? He's already submitted before he ever comes to the Word of God. He, he doesn't want to offend God. He has a fear of God. That's why in Proverbs chapter 1, he already laid it out that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Then later in chapter 8, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, it begins with the fear of God. You see, God is already in his heart. God is consuming his heart. And so now he's going to do everything he can to keep his heart because he understands that it is prone to wander away from God. But he has a fear of God and that is what separates him. Notice in verse number 7. 
I will praise thee with uprightness of what? Of heart. You see, the psalmist says, look, I'm going to praise God, but I'm going to do it out of a clean heart. God knows that I'm sincere. I'm not just going to church and moving my mouth as everybody else in the congregation. I want God to know that my heart is set before Him and I'm willing to pray to God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Verse 10, With my whole heart have I sought Thee. O let me not wander from Thy commandments. You see the connection again. We are, uh, he is seeking God himself, and because he's seeking God, then he doesn't want to wander away from his commandments. We cannot separate those two. Verse uh, verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against God. He doesn't want to sin against God. That's why he hides the word in his heart. In verse number 32, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. You see that? I'm going to run to the commandments as soon as you have enlarged my heart. Verse 34, Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Verse 36, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Notice number, uh, verse number 58, if we jump there. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. Notice verse number 69. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. You get the point? I don't think it's over yet. Verse 70. Thy heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Their their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. There's this uh, delight. Notice in verse uh, number 80. He says, let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. Notice verse 111. He says, thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Verse 145, I cried with my whole heart, hear me, O God, I will keep thy statutes. One more, 161, princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in all of thy word. (laughs) You see, the heart is clear as the emphasis of this great psalm. Let us consider, uh, we see those uh, those, those expressions that say, with my whole heart. All of me. Now how do we know that our hearts are ready? The prepared heart does not tell, does not say, notice throughout all this, the prepared heart does not say, tell me what to know. The prepared heart clearly says, tell me what to do. That's the difference. When do you know your heart's ready? You say, God, tell me what to do. Not just what to know. I want to do, I want to live in a way that pleases you because the Christian life ultimately is not about what we know, it's how we live our lives. It speaks of God. And so, we find the protection of the heart. Our heart, and by the way, if that is not the disposition of our hearts, then it is a good opportunity for us to repent before God and say, oh God, my heart is far removed from you and I need you to break up the hard-heartedness, and make it soft again. But I want to consider, secondly, the projecting of the heart. He says back in Proverbs chapter 4, Keep thy heart with all diligence. Notice, for out of it, the it is the heart, are the issues of life. So out of the heart are the issues of life. In other words, the heart must be protected with all diligence Because everything coming out of our lives is directly connected to our hearts. Now, Jesus Christ said so himself. If you go with me to Matthew chapter number 15. In Matthew 15, we already know that Christ emphasized uh, the heart of man. uh, That he is not interested in the voice service. He is interested in the heart of man. And notice in Matthew chapter 15 here, he emphasizes this truth and Notice in verse number 18 what he says in Matthew 15, verse 18. He says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the, what's the next word? 
the heart, and they defile the man. Now understand, you see what he's saying here? What comes out of you comes from your heart. Those things defile the man. So what does that mean? Your heart is defiled. That's what he says. For out, verse 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witnesses, false witnesses, blasphemies. And so here Christ makes it clear, these are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. We know in that particular text, the Pharisees were complaining that Jesus' disciples were not washing their hands before they were eating. And so Jesus Christ says, but isn't the heart more important than the hands? In Luke 6, 45, again, Christ says the same. Uh, let's go there. Uh, in Luke chapter 6, and notice here what Christ here again is emphasizing. When Christ comes on the scene, the people were consumed with outward conformity, but Christ, the Bible repeatedly says, He knew their hearts. Their hearts were far removed from Him. And even the people that uh, seemed to follow Christ for a while, every once in a while, Christ would have a heart saying, and as soon as it was too hard for them, they departed in one another way. The people were often interested in some physical deliverance. They were interested in what Jesus could do for them materially. They were not really interested from the heart. Their interest was something that was physical, and Christ knew that He did not have their heart, and that is why the majority of the disciples that were following Christ during His earthly ministry end up forsaking Him. In Luke 6, notice, as Christ speaks here, and in verse number 40, He says, The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceiveth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either, the how, uh, either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, uh, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest out the beam that is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite cast out first, the beam out of thine own eye, and then uh, shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of the thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a, a, a bramble bush uh, gather they grapes. A good man, notice, out of the good treasure of his, what's the next word? Heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil, for of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. You see, Christ says here, uh, very clearly as he speaks here, paints the picture of those two trees. There's a corrupt tree, and there's an uncorrupt tree, and they bring forth fruit. So understand, the actions that are manifested outwardly is simply a reflection of what is already in their heart. If there's a good heart, there are good actions. If there's an evil heart, there is evil action. And so understand, the heart is revealed by what is produced in our lives. Now understand, if you don't like what is being produced, Understand what needs to be changed. And that is the big problem of our society today. They don't recognize what needs to be changed. Uh, someone is involved in all kinds of outward evil and they think, wow, we gotta, we got to restrain that man. we got to uh, try to stop him to do what the, the things that he's doing. And the world never deals with the root issue. And often Christians do the same. They have to, wow, well, I would like to stop what I'm doing, but I don't seem to know how to stop. Then your heart is the issue and you have to change the heart. I was reading a, little account by Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh, one of Britain's great sea captains in the days of Queen Elizabeth I, was a fearless adventurer. He was a great favorite of the queen, but he was disliked by her successor, James I. In the end, the king condemned Sir Walter to death. The executioner, whose sympathy evidently was with the prisoner, had no joy in his task. Hoping to ease the sailor's last moments, the executioner told Sir Walter how to place his head on the block to ensure a swift decapitation. The prisoner thanked him. And Sir Walter said, It matters little, friend, whether or not the head is right, so long as the heart is right. Now think about that for just a moment. You know, we like to make sure that everything out in our lives is a perfect display of what we want people to know about ourselves. But the truth is, none of those things really matter if the heart is not right. And so, 
This proverb is a powerful proverb as he says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, I was thinking when we're looking at what's going on right now in our world. The truth is, uh, people who perhaps had certain things that they habitually did, and I've heard conversation of people, you know, the gyms are closed, the, most of the activities are closed, and there's not a, a whole lot of extracurricular things to do out in the world. And so now, uh, we as Christians have more time than perhaps we did before uh, to do other things. And I was thinking for just a moment, uh, this is really a perfect opportunity for us because uh, our tendency as human beings is to make sure that we go and go and go on our weekly routines. We go to work, we go to church, and we go home, and we do things out of routine. And often out of routine, uh, we do things because we always do them, and often we find our hearts to wonder. And I'm thinking here that right now is a perfect opportunity for all of us to say, well, there's a great opportunity for us to check our hearts. Because we can't do the things that we usually did. We can't go to church out of habit. We can't go to work out of habit. We can't do all those things that we previously did. And we kind of rushed headlong through life. Gave very little consideration for our heart. And I believe it's perfect time for the people of God to say, How is my heart doing? And before we open things back up, and before we go back to church, and before we get involved in the ministries of the church, before we serve in the nursery, or teach Sunday school, or do all those things, how is my heart? Because the truth is, God is much more interested in what's going on inside our hearts than what we are doing outwardly. And the truth is that once He has our hearts, everything we do outwardly will be right. But until then, it cannot. You see, God, the truth is, I believe we can do more for God when he has our heart, then we can do out of the energy of the flesh. You know, I think of Samson as a great example. Samson uh, speaks of the judge who had the power of the flesh. Now, we know the Spirit of God came upon him, but the truth is, it was all selfish. He, he, He enjoyed that for himself and what it brought to himself. And he certainly thought about how great he was, Isn't it interesting that uh, Samson, however, killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life? I think that's interesting and also powerful. That the reason why uh, God raised up Samson was to, to, to defeat the Philistines, to deliver the children of Israel. That's why this man was raised up. But all along his life, his heart was not given to God, even though he had the blessing of the the Nazarene upon him. And although he had the blessing of God to defeat the Philistines, the truth is, in just a few moments when God had his heart, God did more with Samson than he did throughout the entirety of his life. Which should speak to us to say, the moment our hearts are right with God, then God can do more with us than we can do with ourselves during a lifetime. May the Lord help us to understand the importance of the heart. And so again this evening, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That is what God is interested in, and certainly it must be what we are interested in as well.